My mom and dad loved the outdoors. We would always tent camp at one state park or another. Some of my earliest memories of waking to the smell of wood smoke and bacon frying, coffee brewing. Bird song was in the air. Other campers would give you a, a quiet greeting as they walked by on their way to the bathhouse. Good morning. I pretended I was still asleep, but really, I was just soaking it all in. I felt safe and at ease, cradled in the affections of my parents, yes, but also cradled in the arms of the natural world around me. Those times are just burned in my memory so vividly I can, I can recall them effortlessly. But one thing I never thought about as a kid, nor even as an adult, not for many years, was this. How did these grand and beautiful places, these, these places laid out with both thoughtful protection for their wildness, but also arranged so people would relate to them with wonder. How did that happen? In short, how did our state parks come to be here at all? This story means to answer that question, for it's the story about the man who, more than anyone else, helped create our Indiana state parks. But it's also the story of how he very nearly failed, and all because of one particular day. That was a day a little over a hundred years ago. So let's go back to that day. It was a Thursday. He'd been looking forward to that day, planned it out, raised money to make it happen, worked on every little detail. Yes, land for the first state park was finally going to be purchased. The newspapers wrote all about it, said it would be wonderful. People had traveled by train, by horse, by automobile, just to see it all unfold. A huge public celebration, an historic moment for Indiana. No one realized what was actually going to happen. For it was one of those days, and we've all had them. They start off just fine, and then end up going totally wrong. That's what I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to tell you about what he planned and how it failed. But more important, I'm going to tell you about the one thing we all need to know, which is this. I'm going to tell you about what he did next. You learned that. You can do it too. You can suffer the biggest failure you can imagine and still know what to do next. In order to learn that though, we've got to go back to the beginning. And I mean the very beginning. Ancient Oceans. Mile High Glaciers. Unrelenting wind. Raging waters. Carving. Grinding. Lifting and gouging. Time and the elements made Indiana a unique and a diverse place. First, the elements shaped the land. And then the land began to shape us. With settlement came agriculture and industry. 
our Hoosier forebears began to transform Indiana. Forests were cut for farming and timber. The city of Chicago grew and vast sand dunes were used to help build it. Marshlands were drained. Prairies were plowed. By the late 1800s, only small portions of Indiana remained that the pioneers might still recognize. It seemed likely even those would soon disappear. And that's when it happened. Half a world away, a 22-year-old German left his native land for a short visit with his uncles in America. His parents hoped the visit would cure him of the scandalous liberal ideas he'd picked up while studying in England. He, on the other hand, referred to his time in England as his awakening. It was like a whole other person was emerging for the first time. An immigrant's dilemma is not easy. Though he thrived in England, he wasn't exactly at home there. On the other hand, he knew he'd never again be comfortable going back to the rigid society of Germany. And so the young man traveled to America. He arrived at his uncle's home in Indianapolis. It was January of 1891. No one realized it yet, but because of him, the state of Indiana would one day be altered forever. His name was Richard Lieber. It is as the father and creator of the state parks will be remembered. As long as men shall walk on the springy sod beneath great trees, as long as there is beauty of things, the people of Indiana will remember their great debt to Richard Lieber. Indianapolis Times, April 17, 1944. Do you all know who Richard Lieber was? What's that? I don't remember the name. Have you ever heard of Richard Lieber? Yeah, Lieber. Lieber Ben Park. No, Lieber. I've heard the name. I don't know why. Do you guys know who Richard Lieber was? Is this where we are now? The man who would never be forgotten is now all but forgotten. So who was Richard Lieber? Well, let's start with this. That short visit he made to Indiana, it only lasted for the rest of his life. The effects of his life, his vision upon our state, have been profound. But when he first arrived, he was an unknown immigrant. Who'd ever imagine he'd leave much of a mark? Hmm. Truth be told, anyone who spoke with him for more than a few moments, because that man had skills. He could speak French, Hebrew, Greek, Italian, German, and English. He could read Latin. He was educated in classical learning, especially history. He could play trumpet and piano. He had an outgoing nature. He was well known in artistic and social circles. He began to write art and music reviews that if his readers could fully understand them, buddy, I'll, I'll eat my hat. Now over the years, he dove into politics, got to know key players, numerous Indiana governors. He also had a businessman's head for organization. He owned a successful bottling company. He spurred fire insurance reform and helped start the first Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce. Turns out, there were more layers to this mere immigrant than anyone expected. But all this is just a hint of what was to come. Lieber's true life work was still uh, invisible to him, unformed. 
like an acorn in the ground, waiting, so far it was all potential. The poet E. E. Cummings once wrote, It takes courage to grow up and turn out to be who you really are. Well, that might be true, but it also takes a bit of luck. Not every seed gets to germinate. Conditions have to be just right. Everything has to happen at just the right moment. And Lieber's moment came in 1904. That was the year Lieber and two friends traveled through the Bitterroot Mountains of Idaho. Their guides told them no white man had ever seen that trail until 1860, and no one after that until 1902. For 45 days, Lieber and his friends lived in the wilderness, ate only what fresh trout, bear, elk, or venison they could kill. They got lost, slept under the open sky. They saw the terrible waste and devastation of a forest fire. And they had to they had to listen to their guide as he recited cowboy poetry, a western tradition which goes something like this. I never changed my white starred shirt, the one I wore clean away, but now it has got so thundering rotten, I am compelled to say, farewell old stand up collar with all your pride and starch. I wore you from September to the 23rd of March. About that western trip, Emma Lieber had this to say. If Richard had not already loved the United States, that hunting trip surely would have awakened his love. That trip really laid the foundation for his interest and work for conservation. To Lieber, the grandeur of the American West was overwhelming. When Lieber returned home, his senses opened to the natural beauty and diversity that was unique to Indiana. A metamorphosis was going on inside the man, a change, something forming, nearly ready to emerge. All that was needed was a tiny push, and it came in the form of a human steamroller. Peacemaker, warmonger, adventurer. Two-term president Teddy Roosevelt was many things to many people, but everyone agreed on one thing. The man was a force of nature. Whatever he did, he did with unbridled passion and determination. It was no different when he embraced conservation. What do I mean by conservation? My friend and fellow conservationist Gifford Pinchot says it is three things. One, develop natural resources to use. Two, don't use them up as if there's no tomorrow. Three, make sure they benefit not just the few, but the many. Bully, bully good. I agree wholeheartedly. But to this let me add, if you're going to profit privately, from public property, you must pay for it. Common sense, yes. Not in 1908. It was highly controversial then. Roosevelt held public conferences to promote this new idea, conservation. Lever would have read about this in the Indianapolis papers. Indeed, when Indianapolis hosted the fourth Conservation Congress in 1912, Lieber was named chairman. The Bitterroots trip, conservationist ideas, chairman of the 1912 Congress. Only one more ingredient remained to complete Richard Lieber's metamorphosis. Brown County. Yes, it was Brown County. When Lieber went to visit a friend there, he fell in love with it all. In 1910, that 49-mile trip from Indianapolis to Helmsburg took the train several hours. Though Nashville is only seven more miles, that part took an additional two hours by horse and buggy. Lieber's wife Emma said it was the worst road I ever encountered. 
But the beauty of Brown County inspired Lieber to build them a summer home there, Whippoorwill Lodge. He and his family became frequent visitors, but his inspiration went much deeper than the new house. In 1910, he remarked, this whole county should be bought up by the state and made into a state park so that all the people of Indiana could enjoy its beauty. The new idea of state parks was in the air. Yosemite National Park had started out as a state park. Lieber had been there. He'd seen it. As early as 1908, Lieber looked ahead and wondered, why not create a whole system of state parks in Indiana, not only to celebrate Indiana's 100th anniversary, but to leave as a lasting gift to future generations? His friend, Governor Ralston, liked that idea. A parks commission was established with Lieber at the helm. But the question was, where to start? Sometimes you go to the mountain, and other times, the mountain comes to you. While Lieber looked for likely places, beauty spots, he called them, fate intervened. Turns out, there was a woman who knew every crook and cranny of a magnificent area in west central Indiana. Her name was Juliet Strauss. She had been raised nearby. She had explored its steep rock canyons, hills, trees, and waters ever since she was a little girl. Visitors called it Bloomingdale Glens, but the locals knew it by its old pioneer name, Turkey Run. Turkey Run had belonged to one family since the War of 1812, the Lusk family. No tree had been cut nor land despoiled in all those years. Surely, here was a beauty spot worthy of becoming a state park. But there was a problem. The last owner, John Lusk, died in 1915. He left no direct heirs to inherit the land. That meant Turkey Run would be auctioned to the highest bidder. Juliet Strauss feared timber companies were poised to buy the land, and she knew what they would do. Rip out all the giant old growth trees, scalping the land, and that was more than she could bear. A journalist, her columns began to feature passionate pleas to save Turkey Run. She wrote to the governor for help. He appointed her head of a commission to save Turkey Run. But there was no money to carry out the mission. Word filtered through to Lieber, and he too was appointed to the commission. He looked Turkey Run over and saw its value right away. If ever there was a fitting showplace for the first state park, Turkey Run was it. But again, money was the problem. They needed at least $18,000 to acquire the place, and maybe more. There was no money available from the state. Asking the legislature to raise taxes was also out. But Lieber had an idea donations. What if the people of Indiana bought it as a gift to themselves and to the future? Lieber got newspapers statewide to print articles about this beautiful park to be. Folks were urged to contribute, and contribute they did. The smallest amount they received was 35 cents. A woman from Bloomington was the first to donate one dollar. Later in that season, they received their largest donation. That would be six thousand dollars from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But overall, money was slow to come. Lieber was disappointed by how few citizens saw the value of the parks and how little they contributed. During this time, he worked tirelessly to solicit funds. No matter how small or far away the group was, Lieber traveled to the mall, eager to describe the value of having state parks. By mid-May, the Park Commission had collected $20,000. That's less than what Lieber wanted, but more than the appraised value of the land. 
Lieber also spoke with prominent Indiana timbermen in advance. They promised a gentleman's agreement. They would make a few bids early on, but just for show. Then they'd do their civic duty. They'd drop out and let the Parks Commission carry the day. In a letter to Strauss, Lieber wrote, We think Indiana bidders will help rather than hinder us. And then it was time. It was Thursday, May 18, 1916. It was the day of the auction. The auctioneer that day, a Mr. Burke, was a very tall man. So naturally everyone called him Shorty, Shorty Burke. All right now, we're going to begin. But first, we're going to sell some corn. Shorty was referring to a few acres fit for corn farming. Not many bid for the corn. Corn was not the issue that day. Then Howard Maxwell of Rockville announced the terms of sale and a description of the property. The entire Lusk farm was divided into seven tracts. These were to be bid on first. Oh, you hear that? This day was the best to last. The Hoosier Veneer Company bought six of these tracts for $37,500. But the main event, the tract with Turkey Run, was saved for last. And finally, the bidding began. Now the lumbermen entered the fray. They started making token bids, but it was just all for show. Thank you, friend, but we need to do better than that. Who give me 500, 500, 501, 502, 503? 9,000, 10,000, 12,500, 13,000. This was the first bid by the state parks. Leo Rappaport, Richard Lieber's brother-in-law, was doing the bidding. $13,500. $14,000. $14,500. A Mr. C.P. Brown began bidding against the state parks committee. He was bidding for members of the Lusk family heirs. They wanted to keep the tract for their own purposes. $16,000. Seventeen thousand. Eighteen thousand. Nineteen thousand. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand five hundred dollars. Twenty-one thousand dollars. Do you remember how much money the state parks had to bid with? That's right. Twenty-one thousand dollars. They were already over their limit. But they were so close they could almost taste it. They had a quick conference. Uh, the women of the party offered up their fur coats, their jewelry, anything of value to keep the bidding going. And so, the bidding went on. 22,000. 25,000. 26,000. The bidding got out of hand. Nobody knew where the money would come from. 29,000. 29,500. $30,000. At this point, Lieber said to his brother-in-law, A hundred dollars more, Leo, and we have to quit. Thirty thousand one hundred dollars. Can you give me an advance on thirty thousand one hundred dollars? The bidding now is at thirty thousand one hundred dollars. I'll ask you one last time. Are you certain you can't give me an advance on thirty thousand one hundred? The Lusk bidder fell silent. The Parks Commission had outbid him. Evidently, Turkey Run would become our first state park after $30,200. What? Wait! Who said that? It was Joseph Gross, an agent for the Hoosier Veneer Company, an Indiana timber company. The Parks Commission could only watch in silence. I have $30,200. Can you give me an advance on $30,200? Going? Going. Sold to the Hoosier Veneer Company for $30,200. Hang him! Uh, people were completely outraged. But the outrage did no good. The land was gone. It slipped away. It had been so close. That train trip back to Indianapolis was a dark time. That night, Lieber wrote in his diary, sick about Turkey Run too hard to bear.
Can you guess what day this was? It was the day that I told you about way back at the beginning of the story. That's the day you think your life's been preparing you for all along, the defining day, the defining moment. And instead, it turns out to be the day you fail. There's no question but what he was sick to his soul uh, at the loss of Turkey Run. They had worked very carefully beforehand with the uh, potential bidders. They had enough money. Uh, the subscription campaign that he managed uh, brought in um, sufficient funds, but there's no question that he was probably at his lowest moment uh, at, at the failure of uh, the state to uh, secure that land uh, at auction. The auction was lost, and the public, disappointed to say the least. Some were angry, and they wanted their donations back. The loss of Turkey Run played over and over again in the newspapers. In spite of everything, Lieber found a way forward. How? I think there's a clue in a book he wrote years later, America's Natural Wealth. Mostly, he wrote about the need to conserve our forests and soil, air and water. But listen to how he ends the book. We stand at the crossroads where signs point to success or failure. The future well-being and prosperity of our nation depend upon which road we choose. Our natural resources are the source of our health and our wealth, of our strength and our independence. Let us be of good cheer and stout faith that through courage, sacrifice, vision, and kindliness, we shall make our contribution. Which road are we to follow? In the end, the choice depends on you. Now that's a clue, not an answer. After the auction, Lieber himself was at a crossroads. He could walk away and accept failure, or, well, or what? After such a public failure, the question remains, where do you find strength to go on? On the other hand, life is patient, and uh, he was patient, and he was determined, and without that disappointment, I'm not sure that we would ever have known the depth to which he was uh, committed from the beginning. It's obvious that Fritz Lieber is as thoughtful and as eloquent as his grandfather. For my part, and I'm just making a guess now, but here's what I think Lieber might say. Failure is a small moment in a long game. Failure can teach you what you still need to know in order to succeed. It's difficult to see this. It requires inner strength. But we each have natural resources inside of us, resources just as critical as soil and water and air. He even named some of them, courage, sacrifice, vision, but they need to be cultivated in order to succeed. Here's Lieber's true genius. He's telling us that the way to cultivate and to unlock and develop these qualities inside of ourselves is to have a place outside of ourselves oases of nature where we can go to refresh and renew ourselves. Beauty spots, he called them. If we can preserve these places, if we can have a relationship with places like this, then we can bloom, we can succeed, we can become who we really are. Failure or success, he was at the crossroads. The choice was his. The future of the state park system depended upon which road he chose and he did not disappoint. How long do you reckon you've been coming? I'd say over 40 years. Yes, we bring a lot of family members here. Our, we, there are 15 of us with children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And it's not unusual for us to try to do that trip about once a year as well. And uh, yes, because they like the water and they like the, the river, Lazy River. And we... It's fine with us, but we, we were fine coming here before that. 
but they love it. And it's a real nice place to bring your, your kid. Well, for me, it just calms the spirit. My son, his wife, and my daughter love the trails. So I know they can come here and they all find things that they, my other grandson's three, so he'll do anything. So they all will find things that they can go do at this park or any of the state parks and I can take a nap. Yeah, I, I am hoping that there are many other kids like my kids that their parents have introduced them to the state parks, introduced them to the values of the state parks, where our tax money goes and why, and that they continue taking their children and can finding what beautiful things we have at the state park. We all always feel fulfilled and happy when we leave. Lieber never quit on Turkey Run. He kept negotiations with the timber companies going for six months. During that period of time, the timber companies offered several deals, all of which would have removed trees from the property. All those deals were rejected. And finally, Turkey Run did become a state park. They had to pay $40,200. That's a $10,000 profit for the timber company. But Turkey Run finally became a state park. By then, however, it was not the first. While negotiations for Turkey Run dragged on, another site came to the attention of the Park Commission. Just outside Spencer, Indiana, there was a lovely canyon and creek with ample wooded areas. It housed a former sanitarium. And so, McCormick's Creek Canyon became our first state park. Lieber's time with the state parks lasted until 1933. During that period, Indiana's park system was admired nationally and widely copied. States far and wide asked him for advice. In those years, Lieber met the first director of the National Park System, Stephen Mather. He and Mather had numerous opportunities to discuss conservation issues, to influence and guide one another, and I bet you a dollar to a donut the two of them talked about another subject Lieber held dear, history. For if the parks were Lieber's gift to the citizens of the future, then his drive to establish state memorials and historic sites was his way of honoring the past. During Lieber's tenure, many more parks were also added, and you can be sure each new park had its own unique origin story. state parks, historic sites and memorials, forests, reservoirs. Lieber deserved a place in Indiana history for this alone, but there was more. The parks were only part of his larger vision. As early as 1916, Lieber envisioned a simple but efficient structure. It would knit together separate and sometimes competing agencies a complete department of conservation. His idea was realized in 1919 when it passed into law. That legislative act ensured that a sturdy organization would exist far into the future. Indeed, today's Department of Natural Resources still reflects the brilliant foundation Richard Lieber originated nearly a hundred years ago. Time has its way with all things. Cut through solid rock, a few million years of running water will do it. Turn rock into sand, a few centuries of glaciers coming and going, just the thing. 
And how long does it take to lose the memory of someone's life story? It takes no time at all. Easiest thing in the world happens every day. You guys know who Richard Lieber was? Does the name Richard Lieber, do you know that name? No, I don't know and the name you... of Richard Lieber. Richard Lieber died in 1944 in the Canyon Inn at McCormick's Creek, the first state park. He was 74 years old. He and his wife had their ashes buried by his statue in Turkey Run. How a place came to be, who a person was, what he or she accomplished, it can all be forgotten in the blink of an eye. Matter of fact, you can't stop that from happening unless, unless you value the story of that place or that person's life. Because while everything else will fade away, stories can remain if we tell them and pass them on. Th Friends, that's the story of the man who set our state parks in motion. Now, when I first set out to research and tell this tale, I never thought it would turn out to be personal, but it did. Because doing research, I discovered that when Richard and Emma were first married, they loved to go and watch the skilled craftsmen who were creating furniture for them, furniture Richard designed. Emma wrote about this in her book. Turns out, that work was done at my great-grandfather's furniture store in downtown Indianapolis. I also learned Lieber spent time at the Turnverein and the German-American Club and other places where he likely met and socialized with my German ancestors. My own father told me that when he was a boy in the 1920s, my grandfather took him to a, to a wonderful high and lonesome place called Weed Patch Hill. That same Brown County view from there is what inspired Lieber's vision for our state parks. And for myself, well, as a boy, I remember camping with my family nearly every summer weekend at one state park or another. One time, we went group camping at Turkey Run with several neighbor families. In the morning, we all went for a, an all-family hike, and I was entrusted with a group of younger kids. We ran on ahead of the adults. Well, I'll never forget the look on the adults' faces when they came around a corner and saw me, the guardian they'd entrusted to watch their kids, there I was, perched high atop a massive pyramid-shaped rock. Wedge rock, it's called. Some guardian, right? It scared my mother half to death. Well, that's the end of my story, but I hope this show, Origins, marks a new beginning in the continuing story of you and your Indiana State Parks. Let's let the man himself have the last word. No one of the millions who enjoy our state parks owes me anything, not even thanks. On the contrary, I am in their debt that they have permitted me, a chance immigrant, to do what he wanted to do. Only in this United States could a thing like that happened.